thank you for making the time to chat with me, um, to chat with really us. This is a collaborative experience here. Why don't we start with some intros? All of you um, are friends of mine, so I will not introduce you, but I would rather have you introduce yourself. Is that cool? Maybe we can start from here. You can maybe say your name, um, what you work on, and uh, what pets you have, if any, just to be relatable. And then we can pass it down this way, okay? So, is this working? Yes. Okay, hello everyone, hi, I'm Aditi, and I work at Egalia, and I have, I'm a TC39 delegate, and I've been working for TC39 staff for over a year now, and I uh, work on all sorts of TC39 uh, things. I have worked on implementations, I worked on spec text, text, and I have also worked on tests. So feel free to ask, and um, I don't have any pets. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nicolo. Uh, I, well, I'm also part of Cern9, that's why I'm sitting here. Uh, I maintain Babel, the JavaScript compiler I hope some of you have heard about. Like SWC, but different. Yes, it's kind of <laughs> like SWC. It's like a bit older and slower. <laughs> and I have pets. If I knew about this question, I would prepare a picture of my pet, uh, unfortunately. His name's Tim, he's not a dog, he's the best dog I've ever met. Uh, he's very nice. I, I hope one day you'll be able to meet you, to meet him. And yeah, that's all for me. Cool. Um, yeah, I'm Luca. I work on Dino. Um, I've been at TC39 since, uh, I don't know, like a, a year and a half maybe now. Uh, I've been um, in like doing proposals mostly, um, proposing features to JavaScript modules, um, also known as ECMAScript modules. Um, yeah, and various other things. And yeah, Dino is the thing I work on, and I don't have any pets either. Hey, uh, I'm Ujwal. I uh, work at Egalia, uh, do a bunch of programming languages and, and standard stuff. Uh, I have been co-chairing uh, TC39 for a while now, so that's fun. Uh, and yeah, I, I mostly work around specifications for internationalization. I love languages, which are also not programming languages, uh, and I have two baby plants. So, good. No, I have this one. Good. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Do you want another? Let's have another introduction. Why not? Yeah, uh, I, I'm Mikel. <laughs> <laughs> I work as a CTO at Orama Search, and I joined TC39 as a delegate like two weeks ago. So this is a bit improvised, I would say, right? Fantastic. <laughs> and uh, I have a dog. It's called Linux. 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 Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. He's gonna, yeah, excellent. I have a dog, it's called Mac OS, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that was a horrible name for a dog. So, um, TC39, you mentioned, Michaela, that you just joined. You just became a delegate. Yeah. Um, and just so that we're on the same page, this laptop is probably gonna go to sleep again. The uh, laptop was not sleeping, the ah. screen was on, only the something was broken. <laughs> You're trolling him back there, <laughs> nice. Um, so TC39 stands for, if I understand correctly, Technical Committee 39 of ECMA, which is the European Computer Manufacturers Association. Is it exclusively European or do America? Okay, this is just the name. Okay, cool. So, it, and these, this committee is responsible for the JavaScript language specification and implementation, as I understand. Okay, you just joined as a delegate. Um, I want to ask you a question about that, but you just raised the mic to your mouth. So, yes. what, so you, you said implementation. We don't actually implement engines. Like browsers, Google, um, Apple, I don't know, all the people that build browsers, they do the implementation. We only specify things. So the only thing that we create is a document that says this is how JavaScript works and tests. And from start to finish for a given feature, I think of something like temporal. Um, what is that process? How long does that process take in specifying something from start to finish? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it really depends on the kind of feature. Some features go really fast. Some features take a very long time. It depends on the size of the feature. Um, but even before we start writing things, Nico is putting up the stages here. Uh, we can explain what those are in just a second. Um, even before we start ri ever writing specifications, there's a lot of work that goes into thinking about, is this even something that we want in the language? Um, like, what motivates this? What kind of um, people might use this? What are like different trade-offs that different uh, proposals might have? Um, all of that happens before we ever like start writing any specification text, and that's and writing specification text happens way before anybody ever starts implementing something. Um, so yeah, there's these 
four stages? Does anybody, or five stages? Does anybody want to walk through them, or? Sure, uh, well, we, we have a stage process. Uh, as, as Luca pointed out, everything starts at stage zero, because we are JavaScript engineers, so we start counting at zero. Uh, state zero, for me, it's, it's just like an idea. At, at state zero, something could just be, uh, you know, a, a diagram on a tissue paper, really. It's, it's an idea, and it is an intent to solve a problem, essentially. It, the, the important part here is that rather than focusing on solutions, at this stage, the, the idea is to focus on the problem. What are you trying to solve? Everything that needs to be added to the language needs to solve some problem. So that's stage zero, it could be in your head, but things start getting official at stage one. This is where we call it a proposal. So stage one is when you go to the committee and you say, hey, I've been thinking about this problem statement and what if we did something about it, right? So in, in many ways, stage one is just a, a commitment by the committee, a very weak commitment by the committee to say, this is a valid problem and we should start investigating this. Uh, do you want me to do the whole thing? Or do you yeah, I think that's good. I think uh, maybe one other thing to clarify is when we talk about the committee, what this means is there's a group of people, um, we didn't clarify this earlier, there's a group of people that meets every six to seven or eight. Every two months. months. Every two months, um, three times a year remotely and three times a year in person. Um, w hybrid in person um, from all different kinds of companies, from Apple, from Google, from Egalia, from Dino, um, people from OpenJSF, which represent Node. Or from people from Orama. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, a bunch of different people that all have various stakes within JavaScript, and we sit down together and then we discuss these proposals. So when we say go to the committee to do something, that means w in one of these meetings, we call these plenary meetings, um, we, these are essentially like, yeah three or four days long, everybody gives a bunch of presentations. That's what we mean when we say go to the committee and do something. Okay, and for the, sake of, for the sake of time, if we can quickly summarize these stages. So zero is a, just a napkin drawing. Right. One says this is valid. Yeah. And then two, three, and four. Right, uh, at stage two, we start getting uh, more serious about things, right? Two is when we start defining a general shape of the solution. So now we're starting to get to the solution. And, and it doesn't need to be completely perfect, but it is, uh, the, the stage at which we, we start really thinking about the problem in, in terms of what different paths we could take, what are the different ways to solve this, what are the different trade-offs which concern all of these different solutions. And, and, and that's done in a committee like with many people are part of that right. conversation. And, and, and one very important aspect of what Luca just mentioned is that the, the, the plurality, the diversity of the committee and these stakeholders is very important. Of course, we have browser vendors and implementers, but there are people who rely a lot on JavaScript or like huge, uh, huge libraries, huge websites that, that care about what happens to the language. So it's important to get everybody on board. And uh, yeah, so, so all of these different parties are, are coming at the problem and the solutions now with, with their own like point, points of view. And uh, we try to take all of that into account. W w one very important feature of the committee is that it, ba it, it works on consensus. So there's no voting. Everything that we do at any point with the language has to be agreed upon by all the members. Wow. So, so it's a very high bar. So I have two questions that how many members are there roughly, um, if, you know, if you have that information? And then the second part of the question is, are all members weighted equally? I, I assume yes, because of the consent. So how many members is that? How many people need to agree before something moves forward? So it's, it's actually not that um, everybody has to agree, it's rather that nobody has to disagree. Okay. Um, so there's, I think at any given meeting, like maybe 50 or 60 people at most, and out of those, maybe 20 or 30 actually speak, um, and the rest are sitting in the back listening. Um, and then, but part of ECMA and part of people who could join TC39 probably like 150 or something in total. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot. Um, it, but really the bar is nobody has to object. So if anybody feels strongly about something, that's okay. Yeah. And so and stage two yeah. then is yeah. you get this buy-in from the broader com committee. And, and then three? Right, so by the end of stage two, we start nearing like a decision among the solutions. We're starting to like narrow down on the solution. Stage three is when things get super serious. 
So by the end of stage two, we finalize the shape of the solution. We discuss things like semantics, things like syntax. How would the solution look like? How would it actually work? Stage three is when we say, okay, like we have done all the research we could, we have sit in our fancy chairs and done all the thinking, and now it's time to put this thing in the real world. And that, that is the point, like when we hit stage three, uh, it is implemented uh, across the board, hopefully. And stage three is when we start factoring important things like feedback from implementations, because people are now actually starting to implement this feature, and they can come back to you and say, hey, that thing you just specified, that is impossible to implement, like, yeah. it just doesn't work. Is there, is there an example of something like this that has happened? Would one of you be willing to speak to that? Uh, yes. Uh, more than difficult implementations, what happens often is that, uh, like, engines say, okay, this, like, it's possible to implement this, it will make it much slower. Or another important thing that we get from implementations is that Engines say, we implemented this, we tried using this in our browser, and we saw that it's breaking some websites. Some websites don't work anymore when, when we implement this feature. So you need to change something because we have this like, like guiding principle. You never break the web. Never break anything. Well, not anything. To never break like 99.99% Right, but a specific example where an implementer has come to you and said, this is literally impossible, what you specify. Yeah, so I think like there's two examples. The, for the first example, for the, um, like, it's too difficult to implement. Decorators went through many, many iterations because the first version of decorators engines were like, if we implement this, like browsers will become, I don't know, 80% slower because we have to throw away our, our, our just-in-time compilers. Um, so we had to change decorators to something that didn't have that problem. And then the other thing is uh, a pretty recent proposal, um, array, uh, what's it called? Array.group. Yeah, array.group, right. Um, there were some old libraries that on, on older sites that changed, that added a group function to um, arrays, the array prototype. And they did this in such a way that if the group function does not already exist, then they add on a new group function. And that meant that once we added a standard group function, um, those sites would not add their own group function anymore. And this new group function didn't behave exactly the same way as the old group function. So then those old sites broke. So what we had to do is we had to come up with a new name for a radar group, um, and I think that's still ongoing. Yeah, we still don't have a name. Actually, the reason that a radar group breaks is even more cursed. Somewhere, a very popular library was checking if group exists on this thing, then do something else without even implementing the wrong group function. And so just adding group on the array, like triggers some pattern that popular library was using many websites developed many years ago, and like that just break and stop working. Even they, they didn't actually, like they weren't actually using some grouping function or anything else. But things happen, and like we like, we cannot just break your website by introducing new features in the language. Yeah. So there's no there's it's, we're never going to just have like native CSS and JS um, as as a thing. Uh, anyway, um, cool. Thank you. We're we're just before. So stage three is when it gets really serious. The spec is complete at this point, and it's it's all the committee signs off and it's, it's ready. And then I'm assuming then the fourth stage is just covering it with tests or what is that? The, the fourth stage is it's done. Okay, um, it's shipped. It's shipped, exactly. Fourth stage, it, there's no, nothing happens in stage four. So just we're all shipped. using stage four JavaScript. Exactly, okay. yeah. And then tests, maybe Aditi can speak to that a little bit when they're added, but um, they're added in earlier stages already. Okay, so for tests, tests are actually a requirement at stage three before stage four. So uh, we have a test suite, it's called test262. And it's actually, uh, Nicholas is just gonna put that up. It's actually one of the easiest way to contribute to the TC39. And uh, I can explain more on test262, how these are written, or, before, or we do wanna discuss anything else before that. Um, actually, you mentioned getting involved through this okay. test suite. Yeah. And I do wanna come back to that, but you just got involved, Michele. Okay. Um, and I think there's a prevalent question in the room, um, if I'm reading the room correctly. How does, one, is it a closed group of elite hackers, or is it something where you know I or anybody else, um, if they want to influence the language, or if they want to get involved in these discussions, how did you uh, join TC39, and is that in fact something that's, that's open to anybody who's just interested in JavaScript? What does that process look like? The fact that I'm here proves that there's no elite 
out there. So first of all, <laughs> <laughs> but apart from that, I believe that anyone that is interested in spending a considerable amount of time uh, working on, on this uh, should be able to join. And of course, there are many ways. Uh, one way uh, I'd like to quote, my, for example, Nicolò, who joined as an invited expert in the first place, right? So you've been invited uh, from, um, um, from the TC39 uh, themselves, itself, sorry. Uh, they reached out because of your work on Babel or something. Yes, yeah, okay. as an influential person and as a lead maintainer of uh, an important project for the JavaScript community, I, I feel like that's a good decision to invite someone like, uh, like him for, for joining this. Uh, another way, uh, if you want to join as a delegate, for example, which is my case, um, in my personal experience, uh, I founded a company, and by paying a fee that depends on the size and the revenue for your company, you can, uh, you can then join the TC39. So everyone here, if they wanted to, could just join TC39 somehow. Uh, and I, I guess now it's better if there is Ujwal responding. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think uh, one thing important to note is that uh, you don't need to join structurally ECMA or TC39 in order to start getting involved. Uh, I think there's a, a lot of work you can do or like a lot of feedback you can give uh, just as a developer. And uh, uh, of course, all these people who are designing these, these different changes are always, uh, it, it, well, they, they are mostly very uh, open to feedback and, and they really appreciate like a, a community perspective because what can happen is that sometimes, uh, we were joking about this with Nicolo the other day, when you're designing something, uh, perhaps even full time for a long time, you tend to sometimes lose perspective and, and it's very uh, enlightening to have somebody from the outside just, just give you a little bit of that perspective. Uh, so there's so many ways to get involved. I think uh, uh, Aditi will soon tell you about writing tests. Uh, so that's a, a big thing. We need to make sure that everything that we specify is actually followed on the web. Uh, otherwise, we get a mess of non-conforming uh, browsers and, and other vendors. Uh, and yeah, so that's, that's the sort of earliest levels at which you can get involved. And of course, you can then go on to be invited as an expert if you have like a, a very concrete stake in something specific, or you can join as a delegate if you're interested in like general purpose. Right, and that's the direction. That's a, you'd pay a fee proportionate to the size of your company to be a delegate. Excellent. Uh, but I um, also like to share, for example, uh, we first met with Ujwal last year exactly here at BJF at BJS Conf, and uh, and I was like, yeah, I want to get involved and. He started throwing me like, okay, polyfills. <laughs> and I've been spending one year like uh, providing coordination over uh, creation of polyfills for internationalizations, basically features for JavaScript. And this is an amazing way to get involved and get up to date with what's going on. And you don't need to be a delegate or an invited expert to do yeah. that. Excellent. I want to speak a little bit, I want, well, to have you speak a little bit to the testing uh, setup and how that works, um, how tests are run and how they're, how, I think more importantly, how people can contribute. Um, as like an in, and once that's done, I, I do want to open it up uh, to you for, for questions. So now get thinking about the questions while, while we um, also dive into the tests. So I just want to add one second on that. Like Ujo no, mentioned, not everyone allowed. can give feedback. Like I'm, I've been showing some pages from this TC39 GitHub org, and like everything, everything happens on GitHub. So like you can just find repository for, for every proposal. You can like open issues, and it's like, like collaborating for any other open source project. Like there is no some special like unknown form where things happen or like it's all public here so like you can just check and like give your opinions and like Th that's an important thing like everything we do in tc39 is completely public to a fault even sometimes all the meeting notes about everything we discuss are are posted to the public and uh yeah all the channels for communication are public so so all you need to do is join in the, the only difference between like any other open source project and TC39 is that like things happen very slowly. Like you open an issue and people will respond to you and things will happen. But before you see anything concrete in browsers, it could take years, right? Like you need to be patient. Things don't happen overnight. Um, we only have six meetings a year. There's a lot of work that happens asynchronously. But like every time to go between one of these stages, this can only happen at one of the meetings. There's five stages. This means it takes at least four meetings 
to go from stage zero to stage four, and it like rarely happens that fast. Right, so. and it's also that that's slow because you want to protect the web, exactly. and not just yeah. willy nilly break stuff. Yeah, we, we need to make sure that people have enough time to give feedback, that people can think about this. Like, there's a lot of proposals going on, um, and people don't have infinite time. People have other work that they have to get done. Um, so we have to leave enough time for everybody to give the feedback, and uh, awesome. I, I think it's a. Let's talk about tests. Okay. So uh, for tests, so the spec text that we have, it's not actual code, and each engine implements it differently. So to make sure that the implementation is exactly how we want it, and it's the exact functionality, we have this test suite. It's called test 262. And uh, so the test 262 has, like, we have tests for each and everything, almost every line of the spec text. And uh, we wrote tests for this proposal, array dot from async, and it was it's a stage three proposal right now. And I'll just uh, briefly explain what the proposal does. So it's just array dot from, but for async iterators, right? So when we uh, started writing tests for this, we prepared a testing plan, and this plan actually shows that we cover everything, that we have some standard tests, we have tests for arguments and for, for all the arguments, actually. And uh, so this one, this is for the, like, all the arguments, right? And uh, you don't necessarily have to do this, like, uh, have a testing plan, but it's, it's a good thing to have. So uh, now I'll just uh, show an example test from this testing plan. Like, these are all tests, like, 50 tests for a single, very small function. For like a this. single function, yes. So this is how a test looks like. And uh, I, I'll go through the test, uh, like line by line, but just uh, to match it with the spec. So we have, uh, so the info here, if you can see it, it says if the map function is undefined. And like it just mentioned this specific line of the spec text that it's testing. So we can go to the spec, we, uh, so this is the spec, there are the arguments, and there's the map function. So you can see uh, line number 3a, and uh, it says 3a bi, right? If the map function is not callable, we throw a type error. So that's exactly what this test does. And uh, so the first two lines are just copyright and the license. Then we have the block comment, uh, followed by three dashes. So the stuff in between this is YAML. And we have several keys. And some of them are, uh, some of them are required, some of them are not. And the ESID is basically, um, okay, so if you go to permalink in the spec text, so the thing you see after the hash symbol, that's what ESID is. So it this makes it easy to reference between the tests yeah. and the spec. Test and the spec. So the description is just one lines, uh, one or two line which describes what, what this test is about. It doesn't have to be a paragraph, it's very short and concise. The info is sort of, if you wanna write some detailed description about it, it's not required, but it's good to have. Then we have flags and uh, includes. So it is about if there, there are any helper files that we have included and then it's just the features that it has, okay? And this is, this is the test. So we are testing for all the non-callable functions and just checking if they throw a type error. You test the JavaScript language specification with JavaScript. Yes. What runs the test? Is there some special runtime that runs this like new version of JavaScript that is not yet stage four that can run this code? Yeah, so uh, for, for most proposals, we have polyfills, and they have their own test runners. And there is a test 262 runner in the suite, which we can use. And also each implementation, like WebKit or, uh, or like V8, they have their own test 262 runners. So they test their implementations using right. that. So because tests are not really for testing the language itself, Therefore, making sure that implementations all agree on what is the shared specification of the language. So like, we don't actually test the spec, we test implementations. So right. for example, Chrome would run these tests internally to right. test their own features. Right, excellent. Um, any questions in the, the, oh wow, okay, there's a few. Um, my throwing arm isn't very strong, so. Um, 
let's start maybe with the back. Show me your hands at the back if you, okay, I see you. I'm gonna hit you probably, just duck. Um, so, there we go. Nice, wow, good. Thank you. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, who is sponsoring all this work in GDC39? <laughs> So the work is sponsored by the member companies. So I work at Dino, and as part of my, um, like, I don't know, the amount of hours I spend every week working at Dino, part of that time is spent working on TC39 things. Uh, so it's the member companies, and like, for example, Egalia is an open source consultancy. Um, they are paid by people that, yeah, ask them to work on specific JavaScript features that they need. Um, so they may be paid by those companies. Um, in your case, you're the CTO of Amara search, so like you will probably be paid by your employer, um, and yeah. I, often companies pay for this because like the, their goal in 39 is like somehow like make language better for their own developers so that they like are more like productive or maybe just making things easier for what this company, like for what they're proud of, like maybe he could have like an array of search function to make his Oh, cool, honey, just a single or maybe I just want your proposals on uh, you know records and tapos to be finally landing <laughs> because I really need it. <laughs> In general, companies don't do it just like because it's something like for 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 the greater good. Like it's because it's something they actually need and that they can make their like their their, their developer happier, like simplified lives of the developers. So so, so <laughs> companies might drive the the proposals that you accept or or not. For sure. I didn't. Right, you said didn't companies, you repeat the so question? that companies might drive the proposals that you work on. Yeah, usually, usually proposals are like there's not all delegates work on all proposals. That's just not feasible. Um, so usually every proposal is it's we don't call this sponsoring. We call this um, what do you call it? Champions. Championing. Championing. There's a group of people that champion a given proposal. And for example, um, like Dino, we're very interested in features related to module syntax because. Um, we use ES modules for a lot of things. So we champion proposals that work on module syntax, and we collaborate on that a lot. Yeah, at the end of the day, I feel like all the member companies are, are trying to work around their interests and, and their products. Uh, to give an example, like most of the work that goes around in internationalization is, is actually sponsored or, or pushed by organizations who build huge websites. And they have a vested interest to have internationalization, good internationalization for their products because what are their options? Otherwise, they either do their own thing, uh, which means that they have to include a lot of this data that is used for internationalization for every website that slows down all of their products. Or they have to stick to whatever primitive tools that already exist to do the same thing, which might not be great and that might not have a great user experience. Uh, and, and the question, can you just throw it, man? I don't have the strength for that. Oh, nice, violence is happening. Got it. Hello, um, you've talked a lot about browser engines and you haven't talked about uh, server-side JavaScript engines. And I'm wondering how TC39 feels about WinterCG, the uh, web interoperability control group. Yeah, so, uh, just to clarify, we don't represent all of TC39, so we can't make blanket statements about TC39 fields one way or another. TC39 is a group of people, so I can talk for myself. This is the equivalent of ChatGPT saying, as a large language AI model, <laughs> exactly. I can't have feelings um, about things. I, I may be slightly biased because I happen to also be the chair of WinterCG. For those who are not aware, WinterCG is a community group at the W3C that um, works on interoperable server-side JavaScript runtime, so making sure that Programs that work in Dino also work in Node, also work in Cloudflare Workers, work on Nellify Edge functions, work on Vercel Edge runtime, and so on. Um, I think it's great, but uh, <laughs> I don't know what other people think. <laughs> so, like, WinterCG and TC39 operate in slightly different spaces uh, because the way JavaScript, as we all know it, works is that it's split into different parts. There is, like, the core part of JavaScript, which is what TC39 standardized, and it works the same everywhere. And then there are like all the web APIs and all the server-side APIs, and those are outside of TC39, standardized by their bodies, like uh, like uh, W3C or WinterCG and others. So like we don't really overlap much. 
and this is not a, immediately obvious to everyone, so let me clarify this. Um, there's a difference between what we call web APIs, which are things that are specific to browsers. For example, the fetch API. Fetch API is not part of JavaScript. It's part of browsers. It's a web API. It's specified by Watwig. Watwig is a, another sort of standards group um, which only the browsers participate in, which other runtimes also um, may use, but it's, it's not a JavaScript thing. It's a web thing. So there's sort of the split there. Right, the boundary between the engine and the runtime, effectively. The boundary is like, you have to ask yourself, would this JavaScript function make sense on my dishwasher? If it does, then it's standard by 39. If it doesn't, it's probably in some other standards body. Right, we have, we have time literally for one more question. Um, so if you really, really want to ask a question, put your hand up like really high. And also, if you have other questions, feel free to ask us later. Yeah, very exactly, much. you're around. So, so one more question, there we go. Kyle Simpson, let's, let's give it your best throw. Oh my gosh. <laughs> don't hit the ca there's a camera in the middle. They don't hit it, please. It's like, like target practice over there. All right, this is the last one, Kyle. Let's have it. I'm curious about stage zero specifically, since many of the people in this room either don't work for a company that's a member or whatever. So let's say somebody has an idea for a feature. Maybe there's another language they've worked in and they wish this feature was in JavaScript or they wish there was some additional idea. They probably don't have all of the backstory that TC39 has about Maybe that idea has come up before, maybe it's been rejected for some reason. So what are some practical ways that somebody could actually get something to be a stage zero considered by TC39 if they're not on it? They don't have somebody who's an advocate championing for them, but they would like their idea considered. Uh, there's, there's, is, yeah. the, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, there is, as you mentioned, uh, to give a little background, the championing part is very important here. If you are not a member of TC39 already, then you can, of course, start working on new ideas, but you would need somebody who's on the committee to champion that proposal. They would need to actually present it before the rest of the group and, and you know, do the motions. You can do everything else. You can help design it. You can even help implement it, but somebody needs to represent the proposal at the end of the day to the committee. So, so that's the champion part. On your own side, what, what you can do is, is uh, you know, everything else. You can, you can start with user research, for example, which is something that we could not have enough of, right? And, and that's usually the first step. There's a lot of design that can go on. There's different avenues where you can go to discuss these things. Of course, GitHub is, is an obvious one, uh, but we have a discourse. The discourse is... That's not a discord. No. No. Okay. Discourse is different. Discourse is different. Discourse is like a mailing list forum mix, which is, it's kind of like GitHub discussions, but before GitHub discussions. So that's, that's a nice place where a lot of people I, I know uh, outside of TC39 like to iterate on ideas, and, and that's a way to get different people who are working on TC39 to uh, you know, engage with them. And of course, there's different chat channels that you can join. Uh, I, I suppose we can flash a link to most of them at the end. Yeah, uh, yeah like, and we, like, we mentioned that you need a champion to, like, to, to progress a proposal, but there are proposals that have like been started by the community and then the community found someone to champion them. Like my favorite one of those is like the Python operator that was born from like normal people. I mean like from <laughs> for all normal people. Yeah, normal people. Like for people outside for, for from people outside of Tier Nine and then some delegates picked up the proposal because like they've been convinced by those other people that started writing proposals and they're like slowly progressing it through all these stages. That's fantastic. Great, that's unfortunately all the time we have for questions, but there's, there's they're around for the rest of the day. Um, I have two questions and then we'll dismiss. Um, and I think for the sake of time, I have one of you answer each question and you can decide amongst yourselves who. Um, but the first question, because everyone here is a JavaScript developer, this is a JavaScript conference. What is one very powerful tool that is a language feature that maybe not everybody knows about, that they should know about, that, that they can take to work and use uh, daily? about the JavaScript language itself? Yes. Something that TC39 would know, but we likely wouldn't. 
You said so you whispered something into the mic. Yeah, generators are my like most powerful feature I've ever used. You know, I've ever used like them maybe three times, okay. but whenever like they were also the perfect tool for what I needed at the time. I'm not sure it's a feature, but like how JavaScript works, if you know the event loop itself, it's it's pretty rad if you okay. ask me. So generators yeah. knowing the event loop. Ojual, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Uh, well, uh, he already answered. Uh, quickly, uh, I, I feel that atomics are very underused in JavaScript, and I, I can understand why they're hard to use, but I think a lot of us write applications that could really benefit from atomics, oh. uh, because uh, you know a lot of operations that we're doing are very like async and all over the place, and sometimes you need atomicity. Like if you're committing something to a database, you would absolutely need that operation to either pass or fail, but not be in between. <laughs> yeah. Okay, excellent. So generators, atomics, and knowing the event loop. Final question, I'd love it if you could answer this, Aditi. Um, what are you most excited for in the upcoming JavaScript language specification? And then we'll dismiss for lunch. Temporal. Temporal? <laughs> yes. What, what is that for the rest of us? Okay, so how many of you have had problems with date in JavaScript? <laughs> That's almost everyone. So uh, we are fixing that. We have a proposal called Temporal. It's in stage three. So we identified all the problems that all exist of them. with, yes, all of them that exist with date and solve those with Temporal. And you're going to be seeing it soon. Excellent. 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 This has been so good. Keep it going for the experts. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We're about to...